I have given a name to my pain. Hello and welcome to episode 145 of the Batman on Film podcast. BOF is the sponsor as well as a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network. Check out all the shows over at batmanpodcastnetwork.com and follow our Twitter at batpodnetwork. If you're listening to us on iTunes, if you take the time to rate and review the show, we'll read it on the air. Batman on Film is also now on Patreon if you like what we do here at BOF, whether it's the vo- podcasts, vlogs, or the website itself, and you want to help support us if you're so inclined, please head over to patreon.com slash batmanonfilm and sign up. I'm the host of the BOF podcast, Ryan Haas, and this episode is going to be our much-anticipated coverage of the Batman in Popular Culture Conference that was held at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, back on April 12th and 13th of 2019. First of all, this conference was such a great experience, both as a presenter and as an attendee. It was fascinating to hear so many perspectives on this character that we love so much from people all around academia and uh, other fans or podcasters like myself, and even the comic book creatives that were there that, uh, that did keynote presentations. So... What this episode will contain is the audio that we recorded from three of the panels that we were a part of. As far as BOF representation goes, I was there, Trey Jackson, who's written for BOF, was there, and so was Rob Myers, who everybody knows is uh, on quite a few BOF podcasts at this point, and most listeners should know that he's the host of the Robin Everyone Loves the Drake podcast that I'm also part of. So between... Me, Rob, and Trey, we participated in four different panels <laughs> across this uh, gigantic academic conference. Rob and I did an episode of of Robin Everyone Loves the Drake that contains a discussion portion where me and Rob talk about our experiences at the conference. Uh, and then Rob has audio from his panel focusing on, you guessed it, the history and legacy of Robin. So if you want more of a discussion about the conference and how that went and some more personal thoughts, head over to episode 92 of ELTD first and then come back here and then you'll get the full experience. Because on this show, we are about to play the audio of the remaining three presentations, which we will start with the... um. Political Philosophy in the Dark Knight Trilogy, which was uh, Trey's presentation, and we will move on to The Legacy of Batman Nightfall, which was by me and Rob Myers, and then we're going to wrap up with the roundtable discussion of the history of live-action Batman on film, which featured me, Trey Jackson, and Rob Myers, all just geeking out about uh, the history and timeline of Batman on film. So... Uh, although I know everyone is probably going to listen to the entire episode, in the show notes I will provide timestamps for the start of each of these presentations, just so if you want to you know, share it with people or co- go back and listen to a, a certain panel, you'll be able to find that pretty easily. So sit back, relax, and let me take you back to April 12th and 13th, 2019, to Bowling Green State University's Batman and Popular Culture Conference. Enjoy. All right. Morning, everybody. I'm Trey Jackson. I teach philosophy at Itawamba Community College and then teach a couple of online courses as well. So the paper I wrote is about um, the political philosophy I see in the Dark Knight trilogy. It's about how the trilogy offers a critique to the central thesis in Plato's Republic. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Plato's Republic. I'll run through it kind of quickly. Um, So, in the Republic, the character of Socrates is debating the nature of justice, and the challenge to him is, are people only just when it benefits them? Why would you want to be just if it means bad consequences for you? And another character named Thrasymachus actually challenges him specifically and says, there's no such thing as justice. Um, 
the only thing you can rely on in a political order is stronger people, you know, exerting their will over weaker people. So Socrates' challenge is to prove otherwise. So the strategy that he adopts is he's going to look for justice at work in what he calls an ideal city, a city that's running perfectly and everything is going smoothly. So he thinks that if you're going to find justice anywhere, it's going to be in a city like that. And once you find it there, you can kind of abstract the principles at work and apply them and see how they might work in the life of an individual. So what he and the audience determine is that justice is really um, a harmonious arrangement of parts in which every part is performing the duty for which it's best suited. So in the city, he thinks there's basically three groups of people. There's the leaders, there's the defenders, and then there's the citizens that you know, provide all the goods and services. And a just, ideal city is one in which the leaders are people who are best suited to lead, defenders are the ones best suited to defend it, and so on. So it so happens that he thinks that philosophers are the best people to lead the city, to tell everyone what to do, when to do it, how things need to go. And he actually thinks that philosophers are best suited to be the defenders of the city as well, because they're motivated by the way they apprehend reality as it really is, and they're motivated by their apprehension of what he calls the good, you know, the virtuous. And so philosophers are the leaders and the defenders, and that leaves the rest of the citizens to, you know, provide the goods and services and basically do what the philosophers tell them to do. So for an individual, he thinks that we also have kind of this three parts to our soul, just like the three groups of people in the city. And what he says is that our soul is divided into reason, spirit, and appetite. And a justice for an individual means that your reason is actually the part of you deciding what to do, thinking through things. Uh, your spirit is the one, is the part of you that's um, motivating you. And your appetite is just making sure your basic needs are met. So... That's what he thinks it means to be just in a city and for an individual. Everything is working the way it's supposed to work. So that's the central thesis. Um, in addition to that, there's two more. There's two passages in the Republic that I think the trilogy picks up on specifically. One is the allegory of the cave, and that's in Book Seven of, of the Republic. And Socrates describes the process of becoming a philosopher, like coming up out of a cave into the light. And once philosophers have left the cave and have, you know, kind of come up and seen the way the world really is, the way things really work, their job is to go back down into the cave where the other people are and kind of bring them back up with them. So that's something that I think the trilogy really picks up on, especially in the third movie. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, <laughs> the trilogy, but there's a lot of cave imagery in the third movie. Um, another passage that I thought really jumped out at me was the... Uh, what Plato calls the devolution of society. And this is a passage where he talks about how a city where everything is working perfectly, things can still go wrong. And he, you know, says it, even if, uh, you know, the philosophers who are telling everyone what to do and are the moral, you know, guardians of the city, like if one of them, uh, you know, tries to set aside some money for their family, that can really, you know, make the whole thing unravel. And that's why he thought that, philosophers actually shouldn't have any money or any kind of possessions or have any familial <laughs> relations that they prioritize over anyone else. So what he thought was that if, if that happens, then what could happen is you move from an aristocracy where, you know, the people who are in charge are the people that should be in charge to a timocracy, which is where the leaders pursue wealth in addition to pursuing the good and the just for the city. And that can lead to an oligarchy where the leaders no longer pursue the good. They just pursue wealth for its own sake. And then from there, that can lead to a democracy where the people, the rest of the citizens, just reject having leaders at all and just kind of throw them out. And that really sets the stage for a tyranny because democracy basically turns into mob rule, according to Plato. And that sets the stage for someone to rise up and just kind of take over. So where do... Um, where does the trilogy agree with Plato's theories in the Republic? So I think one way it agrees is the relationship between the city and the individual. 
Remember, Socrates thought that if you could find justice in a city, you could see how it works in an individual's life as well, that it kind of works the same in both. And I think that happens in the trilogy, or at least the trilogy shows that there's a meaningful relationship between the person of Bruce Wayne and Gotham City itself. Because as goes Bruce Wayne, so goes Gotham City. It it struggles when he struggles. It's redeemed at the end in in the same way he's redeemed. Um, There's a lot of similar characteristics. going. Whenever something is going on in Bruce's life, it's kind of going on for the city as well. So, And I think there's also three parts to Bruce Wayne's soul that you see in the, in the trilogy. There's, you know, the public persona, which is like this unserious playboy, you know, running around with supermodels, swimming in <laughs> hotel um, fountains and things like that. There is the um, private Bruce Wayne, who is the one that actually has this plan of redeeming the city. He's the one that comes back and, you know, is talking to Alfred about what he needs to do to, er- to get rid of the criminals in the city. And then Batman, the, the persona of Batman, kind of works as his spirit. It's the one that puts the plan into action, that actually gets the things done that he wants to, to do. So in the first movie, after Bruce's parents are murdered, Bruce only wants revenge to exact his, his will through force, kind of like what Thrasymachus was um, saying to Socrates earlier um, in The Republic. But what he, what he, when he sees the extent of the crime and corruption in the city, he kind of realizes that what he really needs to do is bring the city, not just get revenge on the person who killed his parents, but bring the city back up, back into a just state. So in the middle movie, he is, um, well, let me go back. He uses fear and that's a big theme in the first movie, but I don't think fear is just a matter of being afraid of something. I think throughout the trilogy, what you see is that fear is really kind of a respect for, the way things really are, respect for reality, and respect for justice itself. So in the middle movie, he's continuing with his mission. He's having success. Crime is receding. Um, the police are gaining control. And the character of Harvey Dent is kind of poised to be that philosopher, moral leader of the city. And that's actually what Batman wants, is to put Harvey Dent in that, in that position. So that's... Uh, He's Harvey Dent is morally upright, he's principled, but he's also driven to accomplish his goals, just like Plato's philosophers were. They're you know, apprehending what's morally good, and they're motivated to um, actualize the good in the life of the city that they live in. So, Batman continues to use fear in his mission, but what happens is he meets the one character in the trilogy who has no fear at all. Any guesses who that is? That's going to be the Joker, right? So the Joker actually remind is similar to Thrasymachus in that way. He doesn't think that there's any such thing as justice. He thinks that it's just a matter of surviving and that the only thing you can really count on is people exerting their will over each other in competition. So he Joker corrupts Harvey Dent, goes on a killing spree, and Batman decides to take the blame and deceive the city so that he can preserve Harvey Dent's legacy at least. So that takes us into the third movie. So the, the devolution of society that Plato theorized could happen, that's something that I think actually happens in the movie. It happens to Gotham City. It goes through those phases. So when the League of Shadows first attacked Gotham, they were thwarted when wealthy people like Bruce's parents, the Waynes, uh, used their wealth to help others. This was kind of a time of democracy where honorable wealthy people were trying to help, but they didn't fully grasp what would be good for the city. So once they were murdered, dishonorable wealthy people like the crime families like Falcone and Baroni, they took over. And this is the oligarchy phase where wealthy people are just exercising their power just to stay wealthy, just to stay in control. So the Joker kind of started the pushback to that. But then when Harvey Dent died, the rest of the city kind of joined in that pushback and kind of toppled the crime families and took them out of power. So the period after Harvey Dent's death is really kind of the democracy phase where the people are in charge, the Dent Act is in place, and people, you know, criminals are getting arrested, but they're they're getting locked up with harsh sentences, and it's really not, you know, fair the way they're being treated. So that sets the stage for the rise of the tyrant in the third movie. Any guesses who that is? 
That's going to be Bane. Yeah. Bane comes to power because of the attitudes of the people at that time. He's able to kind of rise through using a lot of rhetoric to inspire them. And it's just, he brings chaos. So the manner in which Batman's initially defeated by Bane is symbolic to me because he goes, Batman goes to face him in a cave system under Gotham. So, and he tries to use darkness and deception against him, but Bane knows all this just as well as Batman does because he grew up in a cave prison, you know, survived there, lived there most of his life. And during the fight, I think what the viewer kind of realizes is that Batman, through his lying to the people about Harvey Dent's death, he has kind of been hiding with Gotham in Plato's cave, not really acknowledging what actually happened in the second movie. And this is a contrast with what he initially stated to do, which was bring true justice to the city, bring the people you know, out of the darkness of crime back up into the light. So Bane believes it's his duty to drag Gotham out of the cave show the people how corrupt they actually are, because that's what he believes. And after he defeats Batman, Bane takes him to an actual cave prison, and leaves him there, and forces him to watch the rest of his destruction of Gotham City on a TV screen. So he returns to Gotham. He finally exposes the lie about Harvey Dent. He shatters his image as the moral leader. So Bruce Wayne has to kind of reorient himself and his soul to escape the cave and save Gotham. So he tries to do it at first by just kind of exerting his will over his circumstances. You know, he's trying to jump out of the cave and just doing it out of anger. But um, he's just kind of deceiving himself and rather than acknowledging his fear of death and his fear of losing his city. So that's what, when he talks to the other prisoner in the cave, that's what the other prisoner is telling him. He needs to find fear again. So what he has to do, well, go back to the first film, like I said, Fear isn't really a matter of just being afraid, but it's um, it's actually a matter of accepting reality. So in the second movie, we see that having a total lack of fear isn't a strength, but it's actually the nihilism that we see in the, in the character of the Joker. So Bruce says that he wants to have no fear, but the only character in the trilogy that has no fear is the Joker. He doesn't want that. He can't have that. So what he realizes is that fear doesn't limit him. It's actually freeing and good. Because the just man fears and respects justice, but the unjust man is really kind of terrorized by justice. So this is why when Bruce uh, escapes, it's only because he accepts his fear of death, fear of failing to bring justice to Gotham. Uh, fear is a realization of how important justice is. And that's why when he finally does escape the cave, the bats that fly out of the wall, they symbolize his, his um, you know, fear as a child. That's why they, you know, are part of that scene, finally give him the motivation to escape and get back to Gotham. So back in Gotham, he forces Bane to fight in the daylight outside of the cave in view of all the people, and he saves the city. He, so he brings the people of Gotham into the light, showed them their true selves, not, not just who they were at that time, but who they can be and who they must be. So once this is done, Batman's mission is truly accomplished. So those are some of the ways in which... I think Nolan's trilogy agrees with Plato's thesis, but there are some ways in which Nolan disagrees with Plato too. So in the Republic, remember, philosophers rule a city. They have the wisdom to guide the city. They are dedicated to defend it. They're above corruption or supposed to be above corruption. And they're guided by their apprehension of the good and the real. And Harvey Dent is presented as this kind of figure. But the problem the trilogy presents with that is this. Human nature isn't perfectible and it what it doesn't kind of work with the extreme public perfectionism that the, that, that that kind of political arrangement requires and that's what joker wants to show that no one can maintain the moral fortitude uh the sit to be that kind of leader and if the city totally depends on the perfection of its public leader it's going to rise and fall with that leader and it's inevitably going to break down so that's one major criticism, I think, that the trilogy offers Plato. It also shows that human nature doesn't really respond well to this kind of leadership. It's not that Harvey Dent or the Waynes, uh, it's not that they save the city, even though they're, you know, these public moral figures that are trying to do so. It's, it's Batman who saves it. And the reason he's so effective is because he isn't one of the elite. He can be anyone, and people can see themselves in him. And I think this is personified best by the character of John Blake, the trilogy's version of Robin. 
Uh, Blake represents the average Gotham citizen. He looks at Batman. He sees his own potential to do the right thing and make the best of the circumstances around him. So Batman is not a publicly known figure that represents a kind of moral authority. He's what every citizen has the potential to be, and that's what citizen, that's how citizens see him. So he says this in the first movie. He says, it's not who I am underneath. It's what I do that, that defines me. So his, ident- his secret identity signals to others that a citizen of Gotham can do the right thing on their own. Um, the corruptibility of human nature doesn't pose the same problem for every, each and every citizen that it does for you know, the person who would be the moral leader of the city. They only have to do what they know to be right within their own sphere of influence. And if you remember at the end of the second movie, Harvey Dent had kind of failed that test to be the moral leader of the city, but the citizens on the boats didn't. They actually did do the right thing. And that's because it's not because Harvey was more corruptible than they were or that the citizens on the boats were somehow more virtuous than he was. It's because as a public figure that Harvey was, Joker kind of zeroed in on him and put pressure on him. So if, um, if the moral standard of the city rests solely on one person or one group of people, like I said, it kind of rises and falls with that, with that group of people. But if the moral standard is kind of fixed and true beyond just a group of people, then people can recognize it and adhere to it. It doesn't fail. The city is set right by people finally taking it upon themselves to make it right. And Batman inspires this better than a public figure ever could as an anonymous citizen. He's, he just kind of points towards what citizens should be doing and how they should be living. So lastly in the Republic, Socrates admits that deception will be required to keep order in the city. Um, But this is kind of a problem because the pursuit of justice is supposed to be this radical devotion to truth. Um, But Socrates thinks that sometimes the philosophers are going to have to lie to people about, you know, their situation just to get them to do what they need to do. So the trilogy offers another critique of this because if the theory of the Republic is devotion to truth or based in devotion to truth, then using deception is going to be hypocritical. So in the trilogy, Batman takes the blame for Harvey's actions and so that people can keep being inspired by him. But this backfires in the third movie because people realize they've been lied to and the whole city kind of descends in anarchy. So Batman and Gordon didn't believe that people could see the virtue of Harvey's goals and separate that from how he was later corrupted. But the city isn't really redeemed until everyone knows the truth and accepts it for what it really is. So... In conclusion, I think the trilogy adapts elements of the Republic to show that um, human nature isn't really compatible with Plato's political thesis and that human nature requires an external moral standard instead of a perfect public figure. So, thank you all. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Ryan, and this is Rob, and uh, we're going to talk, get really nerdy here and Talk about the legacy of Batman Nightfall. I am a the host of the Batman on Film podcast, and um, I'm also part of the Robin Everyone Loves the Drake podcast, which focuses on Tim Drake, the best Robin. I'm the host of the Robin Everyone Loves the Drake podcast, and also a newly launched Everyone Loves Young Justice podcast, and have been uh, guesting on Batman on Film from time to time. So, I don't know if you've heard about Nightfall, but... Uh, <laughs> It's one of like the longest, more involved Batman stories there is, and um, let's just kind of skip here for the stats. It was one of the largest undertakings DC had ever done from a publishing standpoint at the time, which was, uh, it ran from April 93 to August 94. There were over 80 issues across nine titles, so as you can see, Rob has uh, part one of the omnibus here, and uh, there's three of those just to get a sense of how big this story is in terms of a comic book narrative. And it was, yeah, 80 issues over nine different comic books for uh, over a year timeline. And why did they need to do Nightfall? There's a lot of business and creative reasons why. But um, here we have some images from, like, the top five selling books of 1992 and 1993. Luckily, uh, you know, the death of Superman was such a giant event 
that it was able to break through to like the top of the sales and that carried over into 1993, which is where Nightfall falls in. But if you look at 92, you see like this growing trend in 90s comics where there was more of a extreme or visceral or hardcore kind of yeah. characters that were kind of more popular. Like the, the, you don't see a Batman title on this 1992 list until you get to like number 65 or something like that. So DC needed to do something to kind of get people interested in Batman. So Nightfall came along and it had a lot of cro- uh, marketing leading up to Batman number 500 and there were cross media tie ins like uh, young adult and adult novelizations, audio dramas, and there was even merchandise. There were trading cards and pods. You, did you have the pogs? <laughs> I, I did. I, I did have a couple of them. I never knew what to do with them, but the bat logo was on it. So, so you had to get it. So I had, so I had to yeah. buy it. Yeah. So uh, I'll let Rob do a short little overview of what the story is. Everyone here. There we are. Uh, so the night, uh, the synopsis for the most part is the breaking of the bat. Uh, the newly introduced uh, Bane uh, through Night Quest and Bruce Wayne's absence, a more darker, brutal uh, Batman for the 90s. There we go. The 90s was introduced. Azrael nicknamed Azbats, which I always kind of at first I was like, why are you calling him Azbats? Sounds like you're saying something else. But it became affectionately known as Azbats. Um, Azrael uh, defeats Bane, uh, but uh, comes close to crossing that line that Batman will not cross uh, that Bruce Bruce Wayne never could uh, nightfall ends Bruce Wayne eventually is healed from his backbreaking and uh, reclaims the mantle of Batman so there's your three act hero journey kind of giant structure there um, so I want to touch on the two major characters that get introduced in this storyline you have Bane and Azrael and it's it's a little hard for comic books, and especially in Batman books, for Batman villains to introduce a new character and have them actually stick within like the pop culture conversation. And uh, like Doomsday from Superman, Bane was kind of created, created for this crossover as Batman's ultimate adversary. He comes out of nowhere. He almost serves a narrative purpose for the story. He was actually created second for this. Like Azrael was created first, Bane was created second. They had a like a fill in the blank character bad guy comes in, breaks Batman's back. He was one of the least lesser, like he wasn't as important as Azrael in terms of the story they wanted to tell, but it became the iconic thing of the story. If, if most comic book fans you see, we say, have you read Batman Nightfall? That would be like, Oh yeah, that's where Bane breaks Batman's back. That's like the signature thing. Although it's not really what the story is actually about when you get into the nitty gritty of it. But Bane ended up being um, one of the characters over the last 30 years that has broken through <laughs> to become an A-list Batman villain. And um, after this nightfall, Azrael defeats Bane, and he doesn't show up for quite a while. And he has a slow reintroduction of the comics, and it was always generally a big deal when he was used. And that carries over to today in the Tom King run. He's using Bane yeah. quite a bit. And so the other interesting thing about all Batman media is to see how they get reinterpreted into different forms depending on the media so here you see what bane ended up looking like in uh the new batman adventures uh arkham origins and of course uh the dark knight rises which kind of cemented him as like a major adversary for batman uh his appearance in batman and robin not standing yeah we left that one off (laughs) um uh azrael would be the next character even more low-key uh but steadily present in the batman universe a solo series that uh, he eventually went out of having would run 100 uh, issues and ends up dying at the end. Uh, after a few years, he spoilers. gets... Spoilers. Or spoilers. Yeah, spoilers. There we go. Um, after a few years, a second character, uh, Michael Lane, reclaims the uh, mantle of Azrael. With the most recent shift, John Paul Valley is Azrael again, and this time part of the Gotham Knights and Detective Comics and is now a member of the Justice League Odyssey. So uh, that uh, character has continued to grow and... Um, the Azrael character at first was almost a buddy character to the Tim Drake Robin character while Batman uh, is out doing his thing, finds this Jean Paul Valley character and tells Tim Drake, I need you to essentially bring him into the family, take him under your wing. And Robin quickly realizes over time that there's something not quite set right with Jean Paul that Bruce is so far down the rabbit hole into, into his mission uh, with what's going on in Gotham City, that he is not able to see the onslaught that Jean-Paul Valley is going to unleash on Gotham when he gets the mantle. And by the time 
John Paul is the Batman. Bruce Wayne is in no shape, uh, form whatsoever to take care of of the situation in Gotham, which only leaves Robin, and then a former Robin, Dick Grayson, is nowhere to be found at this time. And the biggest mainstream reintroduction uh, of Azrael will come later this year with this image in the middle here with Curse of the White Knight. Uh, last year, a book came out called Batman White Knight. It is kind of a, a what would you call it? It's like its own separate story, yeah. and uh, and it captured the mainstream in a way that um, is a little bit different than like your regular uh, weekly, monthly comic books. Uh, and it reinterpreted uh, Batman for um, a lot of people, and it, it really caught on. So Azrael is going to be a, a big a big focus of the sequel, which starts uh, coming out this summer, I think. So we've got covered Bane and Azrael, but what I want to get into now is um, kind of what I feel like is one of the more important legacies of Nightfall, which comes to the heart of, of the story. And apart from the uh, monetary and business side, kind of the one of the main reasons why this story was made. So... Throughout this conference, you've probably heard the name Denny O'Neill, Dennis O'Neill, quite a bit. He was—he's one of the the most legendary Batman like writers, editors that there is. And uh, during this time, he was over—he was the main group editor over all right. of the Batman books. And uh, he had done—they had done um, the death of Jason Todd a few years earlier, which Rob talked about in his presentation yesterday, where fans had to call a one eight hundred number to determine the fate of Robin, where he, whether he would live or die. So. That was a pretty big stunt at the time, although the story itself only was like four or five issues. That before issues. Yeah. But uh, a few years later, after Death Superman and the slides I showed earlier, when they decided we need to make, we need to, we need to prove that Batman's relevant. And over the course of the 80 years that Batman has existed, that question comes up every decade or so. Whether like, and I think we're kind of in that period now. Right. Where, like, you'll have a Batmania, then you'll have, like, it kind of would die off a little bit, and then you'll start to question, is Batman still relevant? Do we need Batman? We have all these other heroes. Why is Batman still so important? Why does Batman, like, is lasting this long? So, Nightfall was treated as a stunt with a purpose. And that purpose was, it was designed to challenge what Batman is as both a man and a symbol, and do the core tenets of Batman withstand the test of time? For the 90s, Nightfall was this reaction to the increasingly violent and hardcore characters that were growing in popularity. And um, Azrael, the Azrael Batman himself, was created to be very unlikable. You know, he was more brutal, used more right. force. He almost crosses the line uh, that Batman won't cross. And um, and this was even reflected in Azrael's costume in the series as he became increasingly lost in his Batman persona. Um, and uh, with, with that as well... The line that Azrael does cross, there is a villain named Abattoir that has gone and killed uh, many people. And the Azrael Batman at this point has razor sharp claws. He has a plausible and spiky cape that he's wearing that should not be able to move in. It's, it's a 90, it's a, the whole costume is a, a 90s trope that gets yeah. more and more extreme as like, the story goes on. The why doesn't Batman just shoot the Joker in the head and we're done, that's it. Because it's a line Batman won't cross. cross. Uh, Azrael, Batman, leaves Avatar in a death machine and basically turns and pulls the I don't have to save you line and leaves him to die in his own contraption while Robin wit witnesses this and that's the line that he inadvertently killed him, but almost it's written as it's... He it struggles with the choice yeah. and, and, and because of his indecision. Right, exactly. Abattoir dies, yes. Um, so Denny O'Neill, the editor, he, I mean, he said, like, if people actually like Ezreal, we're in big trouble. Because that means <laughs> our thesis was proved wrong. Because they wanted to make the story to prove that, like, the these core facets or tenets of Batman went out because that's... A reason why he's lasted so long and is a symbol and a superhero for for people um so in the final issue of the main night st fall story in night's end in legends of the dark knight number 63 the the final confrontation between the returned uh, bruce wayne as batman and azrael didn't come down to a fist fight it was more of a philosophical battle which bruce wayne of course wins yeah so um and i think what the the most satisfying thing about this final issue is it's been a knockdown, drag out series of, of uh, punch and run. Uh, hit the bad guy, break him, tear him down to his last final ounce, and Batman punches the guy in the face, and the story's over. 
this is a battle of words with Batman, that he's come through this whole entire arc of knowing the Batman that he has to be, and a Jean-Paul Valley that is trying to rely on every bit of technology and gadgets that Batman has always relied on. Bruce Wayne has come out on the other side and saying, Batman's violence. not about that. Yeah, Batman's not about that. Batman is not about violence. It's about stopping violence. And he stops violence with words and thought and, and a caring gesture to Jean-Paul Valley uh, towards the very end. Right. And that ties into, and, and Dennis O'Neill, although he was the editor, he, and he didn't write most of the books in Nightfall. You know, he left that to, the, you know, his writers, but he did write the final issue of this story. So he kind of put the last final bullet point. And uh, as you've heard in some of the other panels, it also speaks to like O'Neill's overall philosophy of the character, like, in, which you can see repeated in, um, you know, stories that he has that feature, Leslie Tompkins and things like that. So um, I'd like to leave with some additional content. Uh, if you want to hear us talk more about this ad nauseum, here are two episodes of our podcast where we kind of delve into this. Rob and Everyone Loves the Drake 56, uh, me and Rob and some others talk about that specific issue in detail. And on the Batman on Film podcast 115, Nightfall's 25-year anniversary was last year, and we interviewed Chuck Dixon, which was a, a, a big part of uh, writing most of these books. And we have like a two-hour conversation with him about how that whole thing went down. So... Uh, there are those podcasts. You can follow all, us on Twitter. There's our information. Yeah. So, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, so the next thing that you're going to hear is the Q&A session that happened right after our panel. The Q&A session covered two panels. So in addition to our Nightfall panel, there was also a panel that was called Bat Signals, the Deployment of Superhero Iconography by U.S. Military Personnel from Vietnam to the War on Terror from Buddy Avilia from Bowling Green State University. And because I didn't record that presentation, the Q&A questions for that pertain to that might have lacked context. So what I ended up doing was I just removed those questions from the Q&A. But, uh, but it was a really interesting panel. And... Uh, if you are sorry you didn't see it, you should have went to the, the academic conference. So, without further ado, here is the Q&A from our Nightfall panel. Is there a Q&A? I think they said we could go until 11.15. Yeah, 11 so, for many years, um, it was hard to read the search because whenever they would do these Nightfall volumes... They wouldn't collect it. They wouldn't collect it. Even yeah. when they like finally collected Nightfall, like years ago, it, it was only it said, like the complete saga. It's like still not in there, and I was right. I was getting half the story. I finally sat down and read the search like two years ago. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god. Yep, this is a horrible story. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like Bruce is like walking. Half the time, it's like, oh my broken yeah. back, and like propped up on a yeah, yeah it's post, <laughs> or propped the, up on a stick. Or, the, you know, the, yeah, I, the overall narrative of Nightfall holds up, but there are quite because it's so long and so sprawling. There are a lot of '90s tropes in it, and I didn't read the search for years either because of the same reason. I only read like when they tr put it in trades. It was Nightfall and Night's End, and you missed the, the whole middle. Um, yeah. And so I learned what the story was through the radio drama because it distilled the entire story down into three hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the question would be like, what's your experience with the search and your opinion on all that? Well, so because I was so exposed to the, I, I was exposed to the radio drama first, so so I got the like condensed more like narrative first. Um, so like that's just kind of in my head as the more like streamlined version of it. But yeah, like the search. Uh, there's a reason why it has it wasn't like <coughs> included. So mine for me, I did what a lot of comic fans do. Sometimes you just rage quit, and I'm like, Bruce Wayne's not Batman. I'm not reading this anymore. So I kind of left the Jean Paul Valley stuff and followed like, oh well, Bruce Wayne's still in the comics. He's just in a wheelchair, which I thought was interesting. Like, oh, when's he going to meet Barbara Gordon, and when they're going to figure this thing out? And that really kind of wasn't addressed, which I kind of thought was a giant misstep, but. Um, that mm. I, I kind of liked the search for what it was. It still showed that Bruce Wayne was a viable character, was still on a mission, and uh, I, I think it probably should have been collected a long, yeah. a long time ago. It is that. now. I mean, yeah. there's those three giant omnibi, omnibi and um, 
for the 25th anniversary, they released all, all three of the expensive omnibuy, omnibuses are in like nine individual volumes now. So, yeah. Uh, in Nightfall, you know, when Harkin's busted up and he's going to come around and chase the villains, which one of those stories was, your, was y'all either I liked the, of course, so I was like five when Nightfall came out, and that speaks to like, a version of Batman is always somebody's first version of Batman, and that was a really weird one for me as a kid, because I was like, wait, what's happening, you know? So it took me a while to like, get the point of the story, but the his confrontation with, uh, with Zaz, I think, is good, because that's an issue that you can pull out and just mm-hmm. read by itself. And it kind of speaks to the more the philosophical point of of, of what Nightfall is because yeah. it's like it's like will Batman kill? Will Batman cross the line to do, you know? So that's kind of a good single issue, I thought. Yeah, I can't pick one, two. Um, Tim Drake, uh, Bane, and Killer Croc. That's all, great. All in the sewer at the same time. The first one I wrote, yeah. a, a very novice Tim Drake is realizing I'm going up against two giant behemoths. I have no business being in this fight and barely skates out. And the other one I really like is the Firefly story uh, Mm -hmm. where uh, the park is on fire. And that is one of the early signs that Bruce is just, he is already at the end of his rope and he has such a long way to go through the story before his back is broken. I just, I always found that a very interesting, that that was a, and a favorite Firefly story of mine of all time. And for you guys, I was wondering if you talk about how well, um, you thought Rises did or didn't capture the, the themes that you think are really coming out tonight. I thought Rises did an amazing job of that. You can go listen to like a BOF episode where we, that's like 86 and a half or something. It's like two hours of that. Listen to that. Uh, it's 11.06. We still have like nine minutes or something like that. So we can keep going with questions. Do you think they could have done this event or could they do this event now? Do you think it's possible? Are we uh, past this point where we could do this year long, year and a half long? Well, I think everything's an event that is doesn't stop now. Yeah. It's always it's like a bunch of short little events, you know. It you know, it was it was something big like to have the death of Superman be an event and that, that went away and we got uh, Batman, but like to your point, I feel like every event like once one D C event starts, then the next one is right behind. It's a lead in. So I think the to your question, it, it's I think we're way we're way past it. Every story is the this is the life changing event for the DC universe or that character. So doing a story like this, it's just gonna. I think it would roll out now and be like, oh, okay, well, this is it'll be climactic. Yeah, but we know it's gonna get reset. It's not gonna mean anything. Yeah, at the time, of course, like that just hadn't really happened that much in continuity, and people were like, and and the editors were even like, no, this is the new Batman. They let the the readers like believe. This is bad because they wanted their, to show their. They wanted to prove out their point. Like, what? How will people react when we say, like, nope, this is Batman? Although they never planned to have him be Batman forever. You have a, a premise here that Nightfall was developed both in response to sales, in response to uh, this need for Bruce to somehow be more violent or extreme or fit the kind of ninety storytelling, as well as uh, to ensure that Batman is culturally relevant. So with these subsequent uh, crossovers, both like more modern ones going on right now with Tom King and such, but even back in the day with No Man's Land, do you find that these crossovers are in that same vein, or is it a chance to chase sales? Like, what's what's motivating the rest of these crossovers? Well, sales all is always like the big driver, but I think what they do is when they when they when DC recognizes that they have like a, a, a talent pool that 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 the fans like or, or, or a talent pool that wants to create the stories nowadays, that's when things come out like, like your metal or like Tom King's like giant Batman run and things like that. So I think it's, they try to keep the balance a little bit. I think this, it was a little more special time. Like you mentioned, no man's land. Like that was event that totally changed the landscape for Gotham city and all of its characters. The events right now, while they're great, could be great stories. I don't think it's changing the landscape of those characters that involved. It's just a single giant story that, good or indifferent, but it's not going to have a long-lasting effect afterwards as a Nightfall did, where it introduced new characters and it changed how characters interacted with one another. 
I think like in the uh, the cri- one of the crisis stories I'm blanking on the title right now the uh, Tom King um, mm-hmm. that Heroes in, Heroes, Heroes in Crisis I don't know how many long lasting effects that's going to have after that story is done in, in five years are you going to be able to look at Wally West and go oh yeah this this came from Crisis or is right. that just going to be done right. but you can still look at the Azrael character today and go he's operating the way that he is because of Nightfall All right, well, I think that's about it thanks appreciate it guys. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, so we're going to uh, look at, do our best to go through all the Batman films uh, in order uh, through the lens of uh, fans and fandom when we get to that part. So just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Ryan Haas. I host the Batman on Film podcast, and that is a podcast that is part of a website called Batman on Film, which has been around since 1998, started by Bill Ramey, and it's probably one of the first major Batman fan sites, and it's still around today. So, I'm also part of the uh, Robin Everyone Loves the Drake podcast with Rob over here, and um, I'm eventually going to start a, a third podcast focusing on the Azrael character. And I'm Trey Jackson. Uh, I've uh, been a contributor to the Batman on Film site. I've contributed a few articles to uh, another website, Revenge of the Fans, as well that you all should check out. So. Uh, I've heard me speak once already, uh, Rob Myers uh, from Robin, Everyone Loves the Drake. We had got some notoriety from Batman on Film, hearing this gentleman mention our podcast on their show. Uh, reached out to him. He had uh, come over to our our podcast, and I've uh, guested on Batman on Film. So it's great here to be pinch hitting for uh, Batman yeah. on Film. Yeah, that's what Batman on Film. That's what the website does. It's 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 kind of a good uh, home for. A, a lot of different kinds of Batman fans. So here we go. Uh, the fandom part kind of comes in towards the 60s, but we're going to start at the very beginning with um, the very first uh, live-action adaptation of Batman, which is the Columbia Pictures serial in 1943. It's kind of interesting that it's it was their largest scale production at the time with more chapters than a typical movie serial had. And a kind of... A, it's kind of an interesting historical relic because it was made during the height of World War II, and it does contain a lot of like propagandized racism in its villain, Dr. Daka, and it has a lot of anti-Japanese ethnic slurs. And so like if you look at the VHS copies that came out around the, the 80s, uh, all that stuff was like censored. But uh, I think since then, some uncensored versions have come out, and it's kind of interesting that they've done that so you can look back at the history and kind of you know, learn from it. The most notable things to come out of this serial for uh, they'll have to have a lasting impact on Batman's character in the world is that this is this is the first instance of the Batcave uh, as well as the entrance to the Batcave being the grandfather clock, and is uh, it also established uh, a physical appearance change in the character of Alfred, and um, that's probably one of the first, if not the first, examples of a uh, another form of media uh, affecting the comic books that they were based on. Um, and we've seen that happen a lot of times uh, in over the years. Other video games or movies can kind of like seep back into the source material. So uh, this movie was re-released theatrically in 1965 uh, as an evening with Batman and Robin, like as a big long form thing. And this was mentioned earlier today that it was um, in some part influential to uh, some of the producers of the 60s Batman show to kind of spark the idea of maybe this could be a TV show in that in that time period. Um. And then I'm gonna, and then the next uh, serial, Batman and Robin in 1949. It's it's quite a bit more unremarkable in terms of its place in Batman history. It's kind of um, it's kind of forgettable. The villain's forgettable. The it's kind of a, as you can tell, like even the costume is a little bit like less comic book accurate and a little bit less attention paid to uh, you know getting some of the character like character right and everything like that. But it is the first on film appearance of both Vicky Vale and Commissioner Gordon. And another interesting tidbit is that um, the actor that played Commissioner Gordon, Lyle Talbot, also was the very first Lex Luthor in the Adam Man vs. Superman uh, in 1950. And that takes us, there's kind of a gap there until the pop culture explosion in 1966 when the Batman TV series started. And that was our first major instance of what we now call Batmania, which um, is kind of a great time to be a Batman fan and uh, kind of don't want it to end, but uh, it's interesting when that rears its head throughout, throughout our history. So uh, 
the 60s movie came out right on the heels of the first season of the TV show. So it was right at the height of the show's popularity, right before it started to kind of take its down return towards the second and then third seasons. But what the movie did is it did firmly popularize, you know, Joker, Penguin, Riddler, and Catwoman as Batman's most prolific adversaries. And you can see that in the immediately um, following movies we're going to talk about. So uh, it's, as this is a roundtable discussion, I was going to get your guys' thoughts on, um, on these three films. I'm currently making my way through the first uh, Batman Robin serial. Um, I bought for the it first on, time. For, for the first time. Um, I had bought it like three or four years ago. Um, it's always like, oh, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't even remember what possessed me one day. I've got nothing better to do. Started putting it in. And right away, the depiction of the, the Japanese crime boss, I was like, I feel really wrong watching <laughs> this movie. But, um, but again, getting the, the bat cave and those things that you mentioned, just I didn't realize that that was captured on uh, film for the first time. So there's a lot of iconic things that you associate with Batman that we've had through all of these years that are caught in there. So I'm about uh, 12 episodes through and uh, enjoying it, but at the same time, kind of laughing hysterically at the constant keep being thrown over Batman's head yeah. as, he's, as he's fighting. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the Adam West Batman was my first Batman growing up. I'm sure a lot of you have that same experience. Um, when I was about probably 10 years old, I could have recited the entire 66 movie to you. Oh, how yeah. How many times I watched and, it. And I, that's probably because uh, for a long time, that was the only like legitimate way we could watch the 60s Batman right. show was that yeah. it was the only thing available as a kid. I watched the 60s movie on VHS over and over again because the show wasn't really being... It was on TV sometimes, uh, but then and it's something you could watch whenever you wanted to. It was that VHS of the 60s yeah. movie. Yeah. And the show, as many of you fans would know, didn't really come out on home video until just a few years ago. Right. So for the longest time, I you know I just thought Leah Merriweather was the one and only Catwoman yeah, until I know yeah. <laughs> saw the other than my Viewmaster, I used to have like, why is there this other girl that's mm-hmm. Catwoman? Yeah. What about the the darker hair? Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to say that my uh, my two sons, Adam West, is their first Batman too. So I think that's a good place to start. Yeah. So. Let's move on to the second instance of Batmania, which happened in 1989. <coughs> so this movie, Batman, Tim Burton's Batman, was in development for around 10 years from start to finish. And it did usher, kind of usher in the age of the superhero blockbuster. And it did restore Batman uh, on film to his you know, dark roots. And as uh, in another kind of first, this is one of the first uh, cases of, of uh, where, where fandom kind of comes into it. Where there, were, where there was fan outrage towards the casting of Michael Keaton as Batman because it was something that people couldn't really get their heads around, you know, the whole classic, oh, Mr. Mom, a comedian is Batman. I don't, uh, I don't get it. But, but then people did get it because um, Warner Brothers quickly threw out a teaser trailer and that got everyone on board. You know, it's very much, if you go back and watch it, it's not like teaser trailers today. It was a very quickly cut together uh reel of shots from the movie because they wanted to get it out as fast as possible so they could get people on board and then and then that kind of got some of the uh disillusions people had you know out of the way when you said i'm batman yeah exactly (laughs) exactly so you have the danny elfman score the tim burton directing the the actors and the production design it did kind of create the perfect storm of a must-see film and the film broke the opening weekend record and was the fastest film to earn 100 million dollars at the time and it made over $250 million at the domestic box office and was the fifth highest grossing film in history at the time of its release. And it was the highest grossing DC Comics film adaptation until 2008 when The Dark Knight came out. And it also won an Academy Award for Best Art Direction. And um, so I wanted to kind of get your guys' thoughts on this one because it's, it's, it's a big milestone for, for film and super, the superhero genre and for Batman in terms of like the fan response and Batmania coming back. Yeah, I think I've heard. I know I've heard um, Bill Ramey say this, the founder of Batman on Film, that it it may not be the the best Batman film, especially you know looking back at the Nolan trilogy, which we'll talk about later. But it's definitely the most important one. It's the one that really kind of turned the character into a more serious character in the minds of the general public, who were still thinking of Batman's in in terms of you know the Adam West portrayal. I wanted to carve a bat symbol into my head. My mother said no. 
Um, <laughs> I, I had tried to do it uh, myself, and my father grounded me for it. So I, you just couldn't you couldn't escape uh, the hype. I cannot remember what movie I went to go see, um, but I remember passing popcorn down through the aisle, and the Batman trailer comes on, and I am fixed at that screen. That that left such an imprint on me that that's all I talked about. And whatever movie was playing, I kept saying to my mom, when, when's Batman coming out? She's like, that's not the movie we're here to see. <laughs> that it left that such a mark on me that still to this day I'm asking that question. And my mom's like, I don't know what movie that is either because you wouldn't <laughs> shut up about Batman. So let's, uh, let's move on to Batman Returns. So 1992, after the success of Batman 89, Warner Brothers gave Tim Burton a lot more creative control to retain him as the director for the sequel. So he kind of doubled down on the dark tone and uh, hired Daniel Waters to ditch original writer Sam Hamm's script and start over from scratch, uh, incorporating the Catwoman and the Penguin at the studio's request. And so the only way that Burton could get his head around putting those uh, characters in the film was to think of Batman, Catwoman, and the Penguin, all as these like animal avatars. And he kind of explores the themes of all three of those characters semi-equally maybe with Batman getting a short shrift, throughout the, throughout the film. And um, historically looking back on it, the film was actually pretty well-reviewed, but there, but there was a backlash from parents taking their kids to the film uh, just because it's Batman, but the film was PG-13, it was dark, it had some gruesome stuff, you know, Penguin, Danny DeVito's Penguin had black goo coming out of his mouth, and so that didn't make some of the cereal companies and McDonald's and the Happy Meal times uh, too happy. Yeah. It was still very successful, I mean, it had the highest opening weekend of 1992, Although the worldwide total was considerably less than its predecessor, which will lead into the next couple of films. But Returns was also nominated, didn't win, but was nominated for Academy Awards for, for Best Visual Effects and Best Makeup. And uh, I'll start with my thoughts on this. This was the first movie, Batman movie, I saw in the theaters way too young. I was like three or four-ish. I just remember some of the scenes like sitting in the theater and my dad like just holding his hand up to my face. So I like, couldn't see certain parts uh, of the film. But I wasn't grossed out or weirded out uh, because Batman was on the screen. And whenever Batman's there, everything's going to be gr- fine. So, And I was already, you know, firmly at that age, already very familiar with um, Tim Burton's Batman and the whole aesthetic. So uh, Batman Returns was always kind of a personal, like, milestone for me. So, yeah. you guys. So, my parents did not let me go see it. And rightfully so. I was way too young to see <laughs> some of the things that are in that movie. Um it's actually interesting that Batman Returns has kind of um, been a point of discussion and fans, especially people associated with Batman on film. There's a lot of varied opinions about, you know, is it a, is it a very good Batman movie? Is it is it you know faithful to the character because he does he does murder some people and doesn't seem too broken up about it <laughs> at points in the movie? And uh, it's it's a, it's an instance of the villains kind of taking some of the focus away from Batman, the central character. Um, it's a movie I watch every Christmas though. Now I think it's pretty appropriate and, um, it, you really get the sense that it's Tim Burton just getting to kind of run free within Batman's world. And this is what you would get. And, uh, that, those are my, those are my memories of it. Yeah. Um, I was a little older, uh, getting ready to be a senior in high school, uh, watching it and remember going, Okay, this is starting to deviate from the like. I it's like you tell the first movie like, oh, this is a Tim Burton movie that happens to have Batman in it. So a lot of the darker tones and things like. At, at one point, I kind of leaned over to my girlfriend at the time and said, "You know, if Pee Wee Herman ran through here, I would not be at all surprised." <laughs> but uh, it has it was a movie that I absolutely hated for the longest time, and over the course of the years, I have found a, an affinity for it. And it's also my Christmas movie of the year that I think my wife suffered through. <laughs> So uh, moving on to uh, the Schumacher era of Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. And a lot of times I think Batman Forever unfairly gets lumped in with Batman and Robin uh, because after the eventual mixed reception and lower than original box office of Returns, Warner Brothers switched gears for Batman Forever, got Joel Schumacher on as director, and it's one of the one of the earlier instances in the superhero genre of what we now call a soft reboot in terms of um, kind of relaunching a franchise without changing everything about it uh, before, like, you know, Spider-Man did it three or 78 times or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, this was the, f- the film that introduced Robin into this into this um, kind of modern cinematic universe, and 
that's part of an attempt to inject more fun and appeal to a more a more wide wide mainstream audience as a reaction to Batman Returns. And it, the gamble paid off for Warner Brothers because it, it made $184 billion domestically, broke the opening weekend record, was the second highest grossing film in 1995, Kiss from a Rose is on the radio all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was also nominated for Academy Awards for cinematography, sound mixing, and sound editing. I was in second grade when this thing came out, and I was just like, the super target demographic, you know, had to get the toys, loved Robin, it all kind of worked, although, you know, some of the, the sillier, campier aspects kind of were starting to, like, be more present. And I was like, eh, I don't know if that's what I, you know, because I liked Batman and Batman Returns so much. But uh, but it was still, like, not enough of a departure for me to, like, not start to like it. And and with Batman and Robin, that is what happened. Warner Brothers kind of learned the wrong lessons from Batman Forever. They made it only two years after instead of the, the three-year gap that you got in between Batman and Batman Returns. And uh, structurally, the film is kind of a carbon copy of Batman Forever, but with uh, none of the drama and all of the jokes. <laughs> um, and then they introduced all, a bunch of new characters, Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy, Bane, and Batgirl, into, this, into the mix. Um, you know, it's the over, and the overly toyetic look and increasingly campy tone. Put off critics and moviegoers alike, and uh, has uh, had got poor reviews, obviously, in the lowest box office gross of the entire franchise. And we all kind of know what happens after that, but we'll still get to that. What did you guys think of the both of these? Uh, I I dug forever a lot. Um, again, I think my Robin goggles were on. Finally, getting to see an accurate portrayal of Robin, so to speak. But he's in his Tim Drake costume, which I was geeking out about. And even though they it looked like Chris O'Donnell, as much as I liked him in the role, he did look like a thirty five year old guy trying to play a, a sixteen or a twelve year old. But at, at at some point, I was like, okay, we're going to work with it. But you could see where they are melding the two universes together. Like, all right, they're 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 trying to lighten it up, but it still has that darker tone a little bit. Um, in my mind, I was always wanting to see maybe what it would have been like if Michael Keaton was still in the role and nothing else had changed. Would would it have grounded it a little bit more? But, and then Batman and Robin just went off the rails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Forever, coming out in 95, that was the first Batman movie that I was old enough to kind of get caught up in the pre-release hype mm-hmm. and really pay attention to what was going on. This is a nerdy uh, thing for me, but I've said this on podcasts before, so I'll say it here. I vividly remember as a second grader seeing, watching Nickelodeon or something, seeing the very first trailer for Batman Forever come on the TV and just un, like uh, involuntarily tear, tears coming in my face. Cause <laughs> I was like, Oh my gosh, Batman's yeah. back. And there's a new movie. I didn't know it was even happening. And then there it is on the screen. So I just v- vividly <laughs> remember that. Yeah. I do remember reading and rereading the novelizations for both these movies. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I was really excited about Forever because I, you know, you finally got to see Robin in a live action, you know, a modern live action movie. I was really excited about that. And uh, I actually, I was really excited to see uh, the Riddler. I really liked the Riddler uh, from the old 60s show, and I thought it was cool that they finally brought him into a modern movie. So, uh, And as far as memories of Batman and Robin... Yeah, I, I agree with <laughs> its place in in, uh, in Batman movie history. So. All right, so we're going to jump. Oh, and then in between these is the Dark Ages of Batman on Film, but that's when <laughs> Batman on Film, the website, happened. Out of out of the want and need for uh, advocacy for better Batman movies. And um, so that website started in 1998 as Jet D60's Batman 5 page, and that was something that I went home every day, like in sixth grade. Went on the internet, looked at this, so I could like try to see when's the next Batman movie happening. Is it going to like be good? Yeah. <laughs> and and what's what generally what's happening? And so we had to follow all the way from 1997 to 2005 when we eventually get uh, the Nolan trilogy. Yeah. So um, in between 97 and 2005, uh, Warner Brothers took a lot of interesting, to say the least, pitches for. You know, potential new Batman movie. But finally, in 2005, we get uh, the first of Chris Nolan's trilogy with Batman Begins. And this is often credited with being the beginning of what we call the golden age of comic book movies. Though, I think we could agree that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies and Brian Singer's X-Men movies deserve a little credit for that as well. 
this was one of the first instances of like full on rebooting a movie franchise by actively distancing itself from what we had gotten before, both from a narrative standpoint and from an aesthetic standpoint. It was a gamble that paid off really well for WB because we see it a lot more frequently now. It worked well for them, so people are more um, quick to try it, as we've seen with Spider-Man movies. Uh, it made about $200 million domestically, about $370 million worldwide. It's not as big a hit as the next two that we would get, but it did have a lot of success on DVD and home release, and it made the character viable again after what had happened with uh, Batman and Robin. And for Batman on Film and other fan sites, this was a time when they were really gaining momentum and building up their communities, something, a trend we'd see continue throughout this trilogy. Um, this was uh, this was a big moment for Batman movie fans. What are you guys, what are your memories? Yeah, I mean, it was like, for me, it came at, at, in the end of my, like, being in high school, it was like, finally, they've done Batman right. It was a movie that after you see it, I could show anybody and be like, if anybody asks you, why do you like Batman? Show them Batman Begins, and then they'll, they'll get it. Because uh, it, it's, it's, it takes a very, very earnest look at the character and um, just treats it at with, the, with as realistic of a spin as you can get it and kind of incorporates a lot of the best kind of um, storytelling stuff from uh, like when Batman got reinvented uh, in the 70s with the Denny O'Neill stuff with, with you know, hinting at his training and with Rachel Ghoul. And bringing characters like that and Scarecrow into into onto film in a way that uh, seemed really fresh and original at the time. I felt this was a movie that kind of came out of nowhere. Just going to the local library was the only way to get on the internet that I had at the time. And the first image I saw was this gigantic black tank. I thought, what in the world is this? And realizing, oh, it's the Batmobile. What for? Oh, it's for this movie that's Batman Begins. <laughs> And I did not realize that it was already out in the theaters at the time I'm seeing this. Wow. So I bought a ticket. Talk about low key. Yeah, yeah. very low key. Went, bought a ticket, and there were 14 people in the theater. And I walked out going, I think I just saw the best Bat movie I, Batman mm-hmm. movie I've ever mm-hmm. seen. And then you fast forward, and that theater is completely packed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is something to be said about that. The marketing for Batman Begins was deliberately low key because they kind of wanted the – they kind of – didn't want to put too much stock into it after Batman and Robin and they kind of let the film speak for itself and um, and then by the time it did come out on DVD and, and home video like I think a lot of people figured out what was going on for the next movie. <coughs> I actually kind of felt like a bad Batman fan in retrospect because when I first heard about it I thought it was going to be a prequel to the 89 movie. That was just how little I knew about what was going on but then when you finally see it you realize no this is a whole new take and a whole new thing. So, that leads us to The Dark Knight in 2008, and this was Batmania all over again, and to me it seemed like in the summer of 2008, everyone was as big a Batman fan as I was, which is kind of a weird experience, but that's... That's, that's Batmania. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, a lot of people consider this the definitive movie of that decade. It dealt with uh, political anxiety, complex moral issues, the threat of terror for society, all within this pop culture context, and... I know this is kind of a, a big moment for comic book movies because if people didn't take comic book movies seriously as movies before The Dark Knight, they definitely did afterwards. And uh, to that point, Heath Ledger gave what many consider one of the all-time great performances in the role of the Joker. He won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. And uh, the movie did fail to get a nomination that year for Best Picture, But everyone kind of realizes that it's what led to the field of Best Picture being widened from 5 to 10. That was Most people acknowledge that that's a response to The Dark Knight failing to pick up that nomination. Uh, Made $535 million domestically, just over a billion worldwide. And it came at a time when sites like Batman on Film were really taking off. I think a combination of social media and increased popularity of comic book movies... Uh, made these sites bigger than they'd ever been before. What you started to see was fan sites getting the same kind of insider access and information that previously had been reserved for, you know, newspapers and trades. So that's, that's part of uh, this movie's history with, with fan sites. So I know we all have lots of memories of this movie. What do you guys, what stands out to you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolute landmark in, in, in Batman fandom when, when a movie like this can do things like, like change, uh, Academy Award policy. Yeah. You know that speaks to the performances. It speaks to the the writing and the way that this trilogy was made. Because this trilogy 
uh, was made as movie as a movie first, as like a director driven s- story. Um, you know, and then the, the toys and the, everything else kind of came secondary yeah. to it. Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of definitely speaks speaks there. And um, just seeing these versions of of, of Batman, Joker, and, and Two Face through the lens of uh, what the core of their character is, but explored in, in this realistic setting, I just think obviously is going to stand the test of time for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the same reaction I had walking out of Batman Begins, like, oh my gosh, I think I've just seen the best Batman movie mm-hmm. I've ever seen. I knew this was one of the best Batman movies I had ever seen. The, the acting was top-notch throughout, and you were just so invested into the story and trying to figure out the Joker's motives and how everything all fit in and uh, how Two-Face, um, the decision Batman has to make, uh, is he going to save Rachel or Two-Face? And then that's flipped on him. It's just I thought that was just brilliantly done and shows uh, what a good writer can do to uh, Batman and a filmmaker can make out of it. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of times when you're really looking forward to something and you finally get there and you see it, sometimes it can be a bit of a, a letdown. I had... I was really looking forward to The Dark Knight, and it's one of the only times that I, seeing the movie actually was better than what I was hoping for. And that's that's a kind of a rare thing. Um, and that's really what stands out to me, is just how excellent a movie it was. Yeah, I think we need to stop after Rises. So yeah. do Rises. Okay. So uh, that leads us into 2012. We get Dark Knight Rises. It's not quite the same level of hype as we got in 2008, but it's still a cultural event. And again, a Batman movie does something that no other comic book movie had done. It brings an end to the character's story. Nolan wanted his Batman and his trilogy to have a definitive ending. So it made $448 million at the box at the domestic box office, just over a billion worldwide. And again, the movie touched on some political and cultural events that were pretty relevant at the time. Uh, specifically, Bane's rhetoric was reminiscent of some of the Occupy Wall Street rhetoric, which itself was a reaction to the ongoing financial crisis. Um, and though the movie was a financial success, it's probably remembered as the most divisive of all three of these movies. And I think that's partly due to developments in fan site culture and social media. I mean, all three films were well received by critics. They all got an A cinema score. But by 2012, social media was such a fixture of daily life and fan communities were such a significant presence. It meant that fan sites could attract more attention than ever before. And arguments about the quality of this movie were a great way to do that. So you saw a lot of those. So despite the fact that critics and general audiences, you know, love this movie, um, it still elicits some extreme reactions. It doesn't mean that the criticism that the movie gets is insincere, but it's definitely more pronounced criticism than you got for the first two. Um, and one of the reasons the three of us love being part of Batman on film is that Bill and the website have made a concerted effort not to engage in that kind of behavior, not to engage in that kind of attention-seeking behavior. Uh, No spoiling movies, no illicit set photos or other information that's leaked out. He doesn't, you know, we don't want to post any of that. He doesn't want that associated with his site. And one of the fruits of Bill's dedication to that approach came in the form of he got to do an exclusive one-on-one interview with Nolan during the press for this movie. And I know he cited that, that interview and a handwritten note of, you know, from Chris Nolan as like his highlights of running Batman on film. So, um, so yeah, is, uh, uh, we done. Is that good? All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey now, you've been listening to the Batman on Film Podcast, a proud member and the sponsor of the Batman Podcast Network, batmanpodcastnetwork.com. You can listen to the BOF Podcast on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, and wherever good podcasts like this one can be found. Want to advertise on the BOF Podcast? Go to advertisecast.com slash the Batman on Film Con Podcast. Follow Jet on Twitter at Batman on Film and on BOF's Facebook fan page at facebook.com slash jet.batmanonfilm. Email Jet via jet at batman-on-film.com. I'm announcer Rachel. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.